You are now listening to Mark's Unexplained World by Mark the Medium from Hinkley Community Radio, a non-profit podcast radio station. Tonight's episode is about the Sorshi Poltergeist. Over to you, Mark. During the months of November and December back in 1960, in the small village of Solshi in Scotland, 11-year-old Virginia Campbell, who was quite a lonely child, started to become the main focus of the strange phenomena that is known as poltergeist activity. The first few weeks were considered to be pretty uneventful, but slowly, over time, the level of the activity escalated. This started with numerous scratching noises that came from around the house. Noises which nobody could account for. Then, as the weeks progressed, the strange noises increased. And then suddenly, and then eventually, some ornaments would start to move of their own accord. And not only that, but the family also noticed that various household objects would somehow disappear, only to be returned at a later date in a different part of the home. Then things progressed even further and got even more strange, when the effects of the poltergeist activity did not just confine themselves to the family home, but they had also travelled with the young Virginia Campbell to her local school. Greetings, unexplainers. Thank you for returning to another Parallel Universe edition of Mark's Unexplained World. My name is Mark Hughes. I am a psychic medium, a paranormal investigator, and in my spare time, I am a superhero who just hopes he doesn't blow his cover. In this week's episode, I'm going to tell you about the unexplained story surrounding the Solshi poltergeist. And this week's necessary disclaimer. This story is a tale that sadly involves a young miner in distress, so may prove upsetting to some. And remember, you listen at your own discretion, with all opinions and comments being strictly my own. And again, I apologise if I pronounce anything incorrectly. I have found that my most favourite word in the English language is now frequently. I know this because I try to use it as often as I can. Anyway, enough of this tomfoolery. Let's get back to the story. First, let's take a look at the term poltergeist. According to the Merriam-Webster Theosaurus, a poltergeist is a noisy, usually mischievous, ghost that is held to be responsible for many unexplained noises, such as rappings and tappings. One of the tricks a poltergeist is well known for is making knocking noises, so it will come as no surprise to learn that the word poltergeist translates literally from German as knocking spirit or noisy spirit, depending on the you take it from. The German verb polten means to knock, and geist is the German word for spirit. Another geist translation into English is Zeegeist, which is the general intellectual, moral and cultural climate of an era. The English word ghost is also related to it, as it descends from the same ancient root that led to geist. Although ghost has been used in English, sorry, I'll try that one again. Although ghost has been used in English since before the 12th century, poltergeist is a relatively newcomer to the dictionary, first appearing as an English word in the middle of the 19th century, back in 1848. There are of course many famous poltergeist cases from around the world and 
these are just a few examples. The Glencluse Devil in 1654, the Mackie Poltergeist in 1695, the Bell Witch of Tennessee in 1817, the Great Amherst Mystery in 1878, Jeff the Talking Mongoose in 1931, Bawdy Rectory of course in 1937, the Black Monk of Pontefract in the 1960s and 1970s, the Amateurville case in 1975, and of course the most popular UK case, the Enfield Poltergeist from 1977. I will be doing episodes on some of these cases over the coming months and potential years on the Mark's Unexplained World podcast. Virginia Campbell at the time was an 11 year old lonely child who was originally from Donegal, sorry, Donegal in Ireland. Donegal, is it? Donegal in Ireland. Sorry about that. She was the youngest child of James and Annie Campbell, who were both Irish citizens. Her older brother, sorry, her older siblings were at the time of all adults, who left home and started new families of their own. So this made her living situation effectively being that of an only child. Don't get me wrong, Virginia Campbell's parents both loved her very much. However, they were getting on in age, which meant they couldn't always spend as much time with her as they would have liked. This then led to Virginia feeling both lonely and isolated at the same time. And then, to make matters worse, Virginia Campbell's parents decided to pull up their family roots in the rural Irish countryside in Donegal and made the move to the quiet village of Solshi in Scotland. Virginia Campbell, along with her mother, Annie Campbell, was staying with Virginia's 30-year-old brother, whose name unfortunately I can't seem to find, in Solshi, with a view to finally settling in Scotland themselves. On a quick interesting side note, Solshi is a town situated in the central lowlands of Scotland. It lies north of the River Forth and south of the Ockhill Hills, within the council area of Clackmannanshire. Solshi only has a population of around 6,000 people and is located just one mile north east of Aloha and two miles east southeast of Tullybody. Whilst over in uh, sorry, I'll do that one again. Whilst over in Solshi, Virginia's mother, Annie, found a job at a boarding house, which was located just a few miles distance away from her son's home, where her and Virginia were staying. The job at the boarding house that Annie Campbell was working at also came with accommodation, so Virginia Campbell was mostly alone with her brother and his two children, sharing a bed with her nine-year-old cousin, Margaret Campbell. This alone was enough to anger the young girl, even making her somewhat resentful of the situation. But what made things even more unbearable for Virginia Campbell was that her father had to stay behind in Ireland to sell their only home, the only home she has ever known, keeping Virginia's beloved pet dog Toby with him. Virginia Campbell was enrolled in a local school where she was found to be very shy but otherwise normal. Outwardly, she was a placid and unemotional young lady who had a very sociable nature, although, as most young girls do at her age, she was starting to go through rapid puberty changes. So all this underlines Virginia Campbell's situation in that she had to live in a home she didn't like, go to a school where she didn't know anybody, and live with a family she barely knew. After this first short break, in the possible cause for the poltergeist phenomena 
and the beginning of the poltergeist activity in Sochi. This show is brought to you courtesy of Neil Packer and the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre. Find them online at www.hauntedresearchcentre.com or at 9211 Regent Street, Hinkley, LE10 1AW. Open on Saturdays from 10am to 4pm for guided tours of the haunted rooms at just £3 per person. Booking is essential at all times and over 16s only please unless accompanied by an adult. The haunted rooms are extremely haunted and paranormal activity could and has taken place at any time. Some areas and particular objects or items can be quite scary and unnerving. Membership is available for £25 to qualify for selective offers. And why not download the app available on both iOS and Android for only 3 pounds to keep up to date with what is coming up at the centre. According to parapsychologist Lloyd Orbach's research paper entitled Paranormal Misconceptions, uh, Fact or Myth, which is readily available on the paranormal website lovetoknow.com, he claims that someone living or working where the poltergeist manifestations occur may unconsciously be creating bursts of psychokinetic energy that result in what is commonly viewed as and accepted as poltergeist activity. This person may be undergoing significant unresolved stress or emotional pain and without being aware that they are doing so they relieve the pressure of that stress by emitting spontaneous bursts of PK energy. These bursts of energy are so strong that they can affect physical objects. While this type of stress and energy and much other poltergeist activity is often attributed to teenagers or kids going through puberty, a person of any age that is experiencing unresolved emotions and stress can cause these manifestations. In many cases, when someone is identified as the agent of the telekinetic energy, they are unaware that they have been doing it. Likewise, when they are given the appropriate intervention, the activity stops. Sorry about the pause there. The Solshi Poltergeist case all started at her older brother's house in Solshi, where Virginia Campbell was staying on the Tuesday of the 22nd of November, 1960. Virginia and her cousin Margaret were on their way to bed when they suddenly heard a bumping noise, like someone was bouncing a ball. They first heard the noise coming from the bedroom and then the same bumping noise moved to the stairs and traveled to the living room. And just then, as suddenly as the bumping noise had started, it stopped. What was noticed though is that the noise stopped as soon as Virginia Campbell went to sleep. This coincidence, if you could call it that, was noticed more and more as the actual phenomena increased. 
The next day, for whatever reason, Virginia Campbell did not go to school. It was tea time at the Campbell household, and when Virginia and her older brother and sister-in-law were in the living room, the sideboard suddenly decided to move out from the wall by about five inches, and then move back in again. The sideboard was closest to Virginia's chair at the time, however, Virginia did not move it. In fact, no physical person had moved it. And that very same evening, when Virginia went to bed, loud banging and knocking could be heard all over the house. The family then decided it would be a good idea to get some witnesses to the noises, so they called in on some of their neighbours who came round to the Campbell home, where they too also heard the knocking noises coming from around the house. It was then decided it would be a good idea to call on the local vicar, a Reverend Lund, who arrived at the Campbell home around midnight. When the Reverend arrived, he understandably thought it was Virginia Campbell just messing about and playing a cruel prank on her aunt and uncle as a way to show how unhappy he was, sorry, unhappy she was, having to live in their house. However, when the Lund was in one of the rooms with the Campbell family, everyone watched as a heavy linen cabinet began to rock back and forth and move some 18 inches across the vinyl floor and at some point even levitate off the floor and then return back to its original position. As you can probably imagine, at this point, fear and terror started to grip the whole Campbell family and the Reverend Lund was able to calm them all down and after a time everyone was calm calm enough to go to bed. But of course, this calmness was pretty premature because whatever was causing the poltergeist phenomena was just getting started. The Reverend Lund, in an effort to try to debunk the phenomena, managed to establish that the knocking noises, although they were coming from the headboard in Virginia and Margaret's bedroom, he concluded that it was not being caused by either Virginia, Margaret or anyone else present. Not only that, but when it was suggested that Margaret Campbell should get back into the bed with her cousin Virginia, the idea was followed by an outburst of very violent knocking and banging, banging throughout the house. It was the following day that Virginia Campbell again stayed at home from school. On the same day, that evening in fact, they were visited by the Reverend Lund again, who, while he was at the Campbell home, observed Virginia Campbell's pillow rotating some 60 degrees while her head was still lying on it. According to the Reverend, the pillow moved in a manner that would have been impossible for Virginia Campbell to move by herself. The Reverend Lund also heard the knocking and banging noises coming from around the house and again saw the linen chest rock back and forth on its own. On this occasion, though the sorry, on this particular occasion though, the poltergeist phenomena was also witnessed by the family doctor, a Dr. W. H. Nisbet, who was their local GP and had lived nearby in Tillycoultry. While he was there, however, he also heard the knocking and banging around the home, and he also claimed that he could hear a sawing noise, like somebody was cutting some wood. And not only that, but on closer observation, Dr. Nesbitt said that he had seen an odd rippling movement along the surface of Virginia's pillow while she was lying on it. The family had originally called on Dr. Nisbet to see if he could help, but all the doctor could really do was to prescribe some drugs to help calm the family's nerves. 
and although the Reverend Lund had attended the family home a few times, at this time all he could really offer was some prayers. The poltergeist phenomena did not just contain itself to the Campbell family home. Incredibly, in a strange twist, the phenomena also travelled with Virginia Campbell to her local school. On the Friday afternoon of that same week the poltergeist activity started, Virginia Campbell went to school. There, her class, a Mrs. Uh, sorry, a Miss Margaret Stewart saw Virginia Campbell's lid from her desk gently rise, and from what Miss Stewart had witnessed, Virginia was not the one who appeared to be moving it. It appeared more like Virginia was trying to hold it down. And in the afternoon, Miss Stewart saw an unoccupied desk behind Virginia Campbell rise by about an inch off the floor and then settle back down again. Out of curiosity, Miss Stewart went over to the desk to establish a reason as to why an inanimate object would do this of its own accord, but to no avail. It is now Friday night and Dr Nisbet decided to keep watch in Virginia Campbell's bedroom before she went off to sleep. The good doctor was observing the same phenomena as the night before. Again, he witnessed the linen chest move out about a foot with the lid opening and shutting several times. He saw Virginia Campbell's pillow rotate horizontally and a rippling movement, but this time it was on the bedclothes. Dr Nisbet would later describe this rippling movement as a form of puckering, as if due to traction by an invisible agency. Both the puckering movement, or rippling, and the pillow rotation were observed again on the Saturday evening. Otherwise, it was a pretty quiet weekend. The only other strange thing that seemed to happen was on the Sunday when Virginia Campbell appeared to fall into some sort of trance, during which she called out the name of her dog and the name of her best friend, both of whom, of course, had been left behind in Donegal, back in Ireland. It's Monday morning now and the start of a brand new week. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, and there is more poltergeist activity in Virginia Campbell's school classroom. While the children were working away vigorously, Virginia Campbell, who needed some help with her schoolwork, walked up to her teacher, Miss Margaret Stewart, while she was at her desk. While Miss Stewart was helping Virginia with her classwork, a blackboard pointer that was lying on the teacher's desk started to vibrate, so much so that it shot off from the desk and fell onto the floor. The teacher, Miss Stewart, out of curiosity, decided to put her hand onto the desk, claiming that she could feel it vibrating, although the desk itself was not moving. Then, without warning, the whole of her desk suddenly swung around. Both Virginia Campbell and her teacher, Mrs Stewart, were awestruck by what they had just witnessed. The silence was only broken when Virginia uttered, and I quote, Please, miss, I'm not doing it. For a moment, Mrs Stewart stood astounded until she replied, and I quote, It's all right, just help me straighten the desk. Later that same afternoon, Virginia Campbell was taken to stay with another one of her relatives. However, it soon became apparent that whatever Virginia went, wherever Virginia went, the poltergeist was sure to follow. As the loud banging and knocking could once again be heard throughout her relative's house. The very next day on the Tuesday, Virginia Campbell was visited by a Dr. William Logan and his wife, a Dr. Sheila Logan. 
both of the doctors claimed to have heard the knocking noises near Virginia and also observed that they were not caused by her or anyone else. Both of the doctors described the noises as gentle tappings at first. However, when the couple decided to leave the house, the noises became more like violent, agitated raps. A couple of days later, on the Thursday, Dr. William Logan and the family doctor, Dr. W. H. Nisbet, decided, with the Campbell's family's permission, of course, to set up a film camera and tape recorder in Virginia Campbell's room, where between 9 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. a variety of noises were heard. These noises ranged from tapping to loud banging. The rippling movement or puckering movement on the bedclothes was also observed and after 10.30 p.m. Virginia Campbell started uninhibited hysterical talking in what looked like a trance state. By the December of 1960, the Campbell family got so used to all the strangeness and goings on in their home that it started to be accepted as part of their everyday lives. Other strange phenomena that happened included the classroom door banging open after Virginia had been sent out of the classroom and then slamming shut again behind her. An apple floating out of a fruit bowl, a shaving brush flying around the bathroom, Displaced objects and coloured writing appeared briefly on the girls' faces and Virginia's lips turning a bright red. The girls also reported being poked, pinched or nipped on the torso or legs while they were lying in bed. But not only that, there was an article that appeared in a local newspaper detailing the bizarre activity that surrounded Virginia Campbell and news of the various poltergeist phenomena that happened in the Campbell home, which by now had reached both the eyes and ears of the townspeople of Solshi. The Reverend Lund felt that whatever this was at the Campbell household had gone on long enough so he enlisted the help of three of his colleagues. And later that night at around 11pm, the local vicar, the Reverend Lund, and the three other church ministers he had enlisted arrived to carry out a full 15-minute service of intercession. And on a short but interesting side note at this point, an intercession or intercessory prayer is the act of to a deity on behalf of others or asking a saint in heaven to pray on behalf of oneself or for others. The Apostle Paul's exhortation to Timothy specified the intercession prayers should be made for all people. During the intercession, several noises were heard right through until just after midnight. These noises included loud knocks, a harsh rasping, soaring noises, and a scream from Virginia Campbell when she saw the lid of her linen chest rise up. There are many recorded instances where when the clergy gets involved in a haunting, it seems to make matters worse. However, this was not the case at this time. After the intercession prayers, the poltergeist phenomena weakened and even started to die out, so much so that Virginia even gave the poltergeist a very innocent name of Wee Huey, blaming him whenever something strange would happen in the house. And although it was as long as seven weeks later, Virginia Campbell's teacher, Miss Stewart, reported that whilst at the school in her classroom, a flower bowl that Virginia had placed on, on, uh, sorry, placed on her teacher's Margaret Stewart's desk moved across its surface in the same way as the aforementioned blackboard pointer had moved on a previous occasion. With things finally quietening down in the Campbell home, the Reverend Lund believed that he had chased off whatever spirit 
that had plagued the family home. After this second short break, we will look at the various theories for the Solshi poltergeist phenomena and an update on the possible whereabouts of Virginia Campbell. Fright Nights was established in 1999 as the first company in the world to offer overnight ghost hunt experiences to the general public, pioneering paranormal events since the last century. Fright Nights operate at hundreds of the UK's most haunted and exclusive venues. All events have their own team of experienced paranormal investigators, mediums and psychics. They have a VIP members club for regular returning guests offering loyalty discounts and exclusive invitation only events. They can also host private events for your family and friends. You can contact them on 07 852 998 628 or email them at office at frightnights.co.uk or take a look at their website at www frightnights.co.uk where you can see the many locations they investigate and learn about them and the opportunities they have available. Hundreds of ghost hunters join Fright Nights every month for the most thrilling ghost hunting experiences they'll never forget. If you haven't been on a ghost hunt before then why not join them to see what it's all about? Why not visit their social media sites for up-to-date information on all the places they visit and to see what's coming up in the future. They look forward to seeing you all soon. Fright Nights Ghost Hunting Events. Remember, only the original will do. According to the Psy Encyclopedia website, Professor and Parapsychologist Ian Robert George Owen, commonly known as George, considers the possibility of illusion and hallucination impossible to sustain in view of the fact that five responsible persons witnessed the incidents on several separate occasions over a period of five weeks. On an interesting side note here, George Owen was a mathematics. Sorry, try that again. Mathematics. Oh my word! What was that with me? Mathematics. Mathematics professor. Sorry, yes. <laughs> and parapsychologist, notable for his poltergeist research, and with his wife Iris Owen, the landmark Philip experiment that generated both psychokinetic, <laughs> psychokinetic phenomena and communications with an invented dis deceased individual. I covered the, I covered the uh, Philip experiment back in episode 51 of Mark's Unexplained World and the podcast is available through Hinkley Community Radio. With fewer uh, mispronunciations, hopefully. Professor George Owen also points out that the victim's narratives are on the whole generally consistent despite occasional differences in emphasis and that the sounds were further substantiated by the evidence from the tape recorder. The professor goes on to consider the possibility of hoaxing by Virginia Campbell or some other, pos uh, some other persons. He notes that the five key witnesses all took into account the possibility of trickery and then excluded it on the basis of their observations. George Owen also considers a theory that was proposed by a parapsychologist, G.W. Lambert, that hauntings and poltergeist-type phenomena can be explained in terms of subterranean movements caused by underground streams. However, George Owen rejected this theory on the supposition that movements capable of producing this effect 
would have had to be so strong they would have destroyed the entire building around them. He also has a testimony that was supplied by a local surveyor and water engineer that claims that there was no such earth movement in the area of the Kemmel's house. Having established that the occurrences are genuine anomalies, Professor George Owen puts aside the idea that they were caused by a discarn agency or a person or being without a physical body. He notes that the witnesses found them surprising but not alarming and that they were inclined to attribute them to some force or forces originating in Virginia Campbell herself. George Owen also notes that pupescent girls were the main focus of poltergeist type activity in several other documented cases, but that some other factor or factors are clearly involved and that these are more obviously psychological than physiological and biochemical. The professor adds that there is no evidence that Virginia Campbell suffered any discomfort or unkindness. Following her move from rural Irish countryside in Donegal to the village of Solshi in Scotland, however, the change would have con constituted oh, good grief would have constituted a big upheaval for her. What with the separation from her father, her mother, her dog, her best friend, and her familiar surroundings. And as George Owen rightly suggests, having been an only child living in Donegal, to suddenly become one of three children in Solshe, which included sharing a bed with another girl, can be acutely distressing, especially for a girl in her stage of development. So, in this respect, the venomance of the knockings heard when it was suggested that Virginia's cousin Margaret returned to the bed with Virginia Campbell in it may well be very significant. The journalist, Malcolm Robertson, first began investigating the Solshi Poltergeist case in 1987 and says he managed to speak with some of Virginia Campbell's classmates who claimed to have witnessed the bizarre paranormal happenings. Later during, his later, during his initial investigation, Robinson tried to interview the aunt of Virginia Campbell, but unfortunately, she declined to speak to him. The journalist abandoned plans to keep searching for other involved people with the case. However, his desire to find out more information resurfaced in 1994, and he started to look for potential witnesses to the strange events once again. I can't seem to find a lot of details as to the whereabouts of Virginia Campbell today, or at the time of writing this show. I can tell you that after a long time of feeling isolated whilst living with her older brother and his family in Donegal, Virginia managed to make a new close friend, and most importantly, she was reunited with her beloved, beloved pet dog, Toby. I think it's safe to say that these two instances alone would have considerably affected her mood. And by January 1961, with all the good things back in her life, the poltergeist activity abruptly stopped. So after months of knocks, bangs, sawing, furniture moving and pillow rippling, peace finally settled on the Campbell household. And Virginia Campbell was finally happy. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World and apologies for the people of Donegal in Ireland. In our next episode, show 69, we are going to be looking at the Manzies UFO. The Manzies UFO incident took place on the 11th of November back in 1979 
which forced a commercial aeroplane flight of the Spanish company Transportes Aereos Españolas with 109 passengers on board to make an emergency landing at the Manzis Airport in Valencia, Spain when they were flying over the island of Ibiza. After the emergency landing, a Spanish Air Force fighter aircraft took off from Los Lanas base in order to intercept the mysterious object. It has since become known as the most famous UFO sighting in Spain. This show was written and researched by myself, Mark Hughes, and proofread and edited by Linda Hughes. The actors in this episode were Mark Hughes, Linda Hughes and Denise Pula. With special thanks to Neil Packer and the staff at the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre in Hinckley. And a big thanks to everyone for listening. Mark's unexplained world, because there's more to the paranormal than meets the third eye. And remember guys, keep it real, because being real is better than being perfect. This show and all its contents are covered by basic copyright of Mark the Medium. <laughs>